For those of you out there who have studied the martial arts or is actively currently studying an art, you know that working with a partner is a very large and crucial aspect of training. And it really shouldn't matter which art you're doing, whether it's a grappling art, striking, throwing, or even weapon based, you will be working with another person at some point in time. Actually, preferably, hopefully, for a significant amount of your training. When it comes to working with partners, however, there's a lot more to take into consideration than just stand there and let me do this to you. There's a mental discipline that comes into play as well as the physical. And in today's episode, we're going to explore some of these considerations when working with partners. Also, please visit our Patreon page. By joining, you are helping us produce this channel and branch out to more arts, topics, and interviews. Members also get access to exclusive content for signing up, so please check it out if you haven't already. And I would like to issue a great big thank you to those of you who have joined us so far. Bluntly speaking, if you do not practice the martial arts and you don't work with another person, you are missing a giant part of your training. It's easy to do stuff in the air. It's easy to practice by yourself, read from a book, watch from a video, even in class, watch and imitate. Working with a person is a crucial part. And if you are, if you are not embarking in that, if you are not working with another physical human being, you are missing a great big part of your training. And also what's unfortunate too is a lot of schools that don't practice even active sparring or don't practice partner work, it presents a sense of false security for the students. You're talking about overall an industry or overall concept of martial arts is to protect yourself. And if somebody practices, no matter how much time they spend practicing, if they never work or train with another person, they're gonna feel like they've got the skill they might not be able to apply it. It could give them a false sense of security because if they have not actually applied it, they don't know if it works. And this also touches on online training. We did an episode recently about training online martial arts using like online programs. They're good, they've got their benefits and their advantages for sure. But one downfall is you can only train in your living room for so long or get to a certain point. I always recommend that if you're gonna do an online program, try to find, try either do it with a friend or try to find someone else or a school that you can maybe partner up with to work with a person. Cause again, you need that live feedback. Otherwise you're only getting this much of the art when you, there's a broader spectrum to, to approach. You hear this criticism a lot that if you want art to be effective, you need to have resistance training. And I do agree with that that's the only way you're gonna make things work, or at least understand them to their full potential. Now there are four levels of resistance training that I take a look at, that I take in consideration. The first one is solo. You're practicing solo. So when you first, for the very first time, learn a martial art and you're like, okay, I need to do the, the motion, it's, it's a block and it's a punch. Okay, it's fine to do that by yourself. Do it in the air, learn the motions, learn the steps, and kind of commit that part to memory. So just get used to it and understand it and learn it. The next step, of the resistance is compliant. Now you're working with your partner for the first time and they're gonna be fully compliant. You know, they're gonna throw the attack and they're gonna completely let you do the block and they're gonna do the counter punch. They're gonna go with you. They're gonna react the way they're supposed to react. So that way you understand how it is applied on a person. So you first did your solo training. So you learn the steps. Now you're seeing how the steps apply on a person. Once you're good with that, you move on to semi-compliant where now you're like, okay, now your partner's gonna give you a little bit of resistance. They're gonna try to, oh, maybe they're gonna try to move out of the way, or if you don't move fast enough, they're gonna try to do a counter attack. Something to keep you on your toes and push you a little bit further. So you're actually going from, I'm just learning the steps, memorization, to application, now to a little bit of resistance, up to non-compliant, the fourth phase of resistance. And this is usually freestyle sparring or a partner that's not gonna let you at all. So you see this a lot in grappling. So if you learn a takedown, and this is the point where your, your partner's like, no, you're not gonna take me down unless you, you actually earn it. So that's, you know, randori and sparring. That is where you know the technique is good. So you work on these phases. And I do believe that all four of these phases are important. And this is where a lot of arts fall. Especially, I hear this criticism a lot in Kempo. Oh, person's never gonna stand there and let you do that to them. No, of course they're not going to. But that, what you're watching is a compliant stage. It's not gonna work. No technique's gonna work or you really shouldn't depend on it until you have made it work on someone who is trying to stop you from doing it. And I believe this to all arts. I don't think it matters what art it is, whether it be Kempo, boxing, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Eskrima. First you learn your technique, then you learn how it works on a person, then you apply a little bit of pressure and then you have to make it work against a full resisting opponent. And you have to do that with every single technique. 
a lot of schools were like, okay, here's a step. You practice it, you memorize it, good, you got it. Okay, next one. You do that cup for a month, you get your next belt. It's more to memorization. You have to make it work in a situation that's trying to not let you make it work. That to me is when you've completed that technique and when you've made it work, then you move on to the next one. So a lot of times in a lot of arts, especially the Japanese arts, you'll hear the term uke. Uke simply means someone who receives. And in the case of a self-defense technique when you're doing drills, the uke is usually the bad guy or the guy who's going to do the attack and the tori is the one who's doing the defense. Now, tori kind of translates to, you know, someone who takes or chooses and uke is someone who receives. So it doesn't really mean good guy, bad guy. It really refers to somebody who is applying a technique and the other person who is receiving the technique. So technically speaking, tori and uke is based on the success of the technique, not necessarily who initiated the attack. If a bad guy comes up and attacks me and I successfully pull off a self-defense technique, well, he is the uke because he received it. But if he comes up and attacks me, he starts to fight, and I say, I throw the punch to defend myself, and he grabs me, he throws me, now I'm the uke because he successfully completed the technique and I took it and received it. So that's just kind of a little bit of a breakdown. Just so you understand, you'll hear those terms. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with the Japanese arts, you have tori and you have uke. Okay, so now let's talk about control. In my opinion, control is one of the most important things you can have when working with a partner. And when I say control, I mean you're controlling your actions, and you're controlling their reactions. And I'm not talking about holding back. I'm talking about but controlling and regulating your intention. As a black belt or as an advanced student, you should be able to put as much force behind a strike and be able to stop it or give it a half effort or a full contact at your will. You need to be in charge of your actions. You are accountable for your own strikes and your own actions. And when I'm talking about controlling reactions, I mean controlling how that person's gonna move. And that's part of why you, we do the, the compliance steps first. So when you throw a strike, when you're working with a partner, you can see how the body might react. So that when a real situation occurs, you're not only controlling your power and your technique, but you're also controlling the way their body reacts the best that you can to set you up for your next, your, your next technique, your next combo, or maybe an escape. You know, as an example, I need a white belt. Are there any white belts around? Hey, white belt Zach, everybody. So what I mean with control, if you know, we're working together, Zach needs to have full trust that I have control. So like if he's grabbing me and I want to come do a technique that you know, breaks the elbow and try to set up for a strike, working with the partner, I'm not going to go hit him as hard as I can with the elbow, but I'm not going to go, so there's, there's a give and take here. I'm going to put my effort in, I'm going to put my speed and the power, but I'm going to control it. So when he grabs, I'm going to actually kind of hit and but not stop. I don't want to hurt him. And then for the next motion, so you do your power, you do your strike, so he should take full, I should be able to aim right at him and he knows I'm not gonna hit him. I'm gonna throw full power and stop just grazing him. Okay, so it's full effort. I'm not pulling a punch. You know, pulling punches, you actually actively go and you hold back. You don't wanna hold back. And also what you see a lot is you don't wanna do this. Mm. You're doing the technique and I'm gonna go, mm, pretend I hit your face. If you train like this, you're gonna practice like that, you're gonna react like that. You don't want to, so you don't want to pull your punches and you don't want to miss intentionally. And this is where, again, that control comes in. So I should be able to throw a strike at this board, full power, and stop. I should be able to control. I'm not holding back. I'm relaxed, I'm relaxed, then I tense and stop. Only breaking it when I fully intend to. It's about your intention and your control. You need that level of control. When, when you're working a drill with a partner, it benefits both people to make some contact. Now, if you're starting off, of course, you want to start off light and you work your way up. But if we're working a technique where Zach throws a punch, I'm going to do a block and do a counter punch. That, okay, right there is step one, step two. This is the full compliant phase. We are practicing. But if you're going to apply it later, you know, we're going to do it again. He's going to throw the punch. I'm going to go, you know, I didn't really hit him. I didn't make any contact. Once you learn the steps, start making shots. Actually, make contact with the body. And as you go, Go a little bit harder, and as people condition and work, you can go harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder. And that's one thing with Kempo too, is we like to do those drills on each other, especially body shots. The body, when conditioned, can take quite a shot. Now, if I can probably again, sir, when it comes to things like the face, you wanna be more careful, of course. We're not gonna come in, you know, we might come in and just like a heavy body shot and drill our partner, you know, toughness, because we, you know, we can tense our muscles and all that. Face is a little bit different. Now, when you're doing the face, like I said before, is you don't wanna go, or, pretending you don't want to miss them intentionally, but we make contact and we do two different things. Like what we do in our school or in our classes is when we get to a face strike, we'll control it and maybe we'll do like a push to kind of simulate that we're actually 
getting the reaction we want, but we're making contact, so at least our placement is correct. Or sometimes we'll do like an open hand strike if it's light, or even my, one of my instructor's personal favorites was like if it was like a palm heel or a hammering strike to the face, sometimes we'd go to the chest instead. So at least we made contact, get used to striking your opponent. There's other body parts that you gotta take into consideration. So that's the face is one thing. Groin shots, all right, no big deal. First of all, guys, you should be wearing a cup in class. Even girls, you should be wearing a cup too. Getting hit there hurts. But we don't, you know, especially in Kempo, and at least in our classes too, we will hit to the groin. You know, we'll do hammer shots. Whatever a groin shot is called for, we make contact. So we make our students wear groin cups. Now, especially when working with kids or even beginners, so one way you can do them to contact without necessarily hitting the groin, or if the person forgot the cup that day and you feel like showing a little bit of mercy, sometimes you get a little bit of a tap to the inner side, just to kind of, as a warning, say, hey, I'm tagging you, I'm getting you, but you know, the technique is there. Knees. Knees you gotta be careful with, because they can be strong, but a, a, a strike to the knee in the wrong direction can cause lifelong injury. So when you're working with your partner and you have any knee shots whatsoever, just be cautious, like get the reaction you want, but maybe go a little bit slower on that. Cause the last thing you want to do is blow out your partner's knee. You've just destroyed the training. You might've given them a lifelong injury or crippled them, or at least at the very least, give them a long recovery time before coming back. Take great care when working with someone's knees. Same thing with the neck. The neck can be pretty meaty. You can get some good solid shots to the neck, but watch the trachea that, that it takes very little force to injure it. And again, you don't want to go, your goal is not to hurt your partner. And part of it also comes to being a good uke. If you're working, if you're being the bad guy and you're in the compliant phase, don't just stand there. You know, if the person hits you, don't just stand there, at least mimic the action. Part of being a good uke is playing along at the beginning. Let the person learn the technique, how the body's supposed to react. And then little by little, you can start saying, okay, well, if they waited too long, well, I'm gonna throw them another strike now kind of up the ante a little bit, make them work a little bit more. And then later when you guys go into randori or sparring or whatever, you got the full resistance. So part of working with partners is not only being good at applying your technique on your partner, but also being good at receiving it. When you're working with the opposite gender, you, you may or may not, depends on their experience level if you want to take it easy or not. If you're working with a woman, first of all, there's a lot of tough women out there. Don't treat them like glass. Show them respect. Help them condition, you know, help them work to their level. So. Make sure the person is comfortable, like even talk ahead of time, what kind of strikes you want. The women that's been in our classes, they get mad if you don't hit them. If you take it easy on them, they get pissed. So it's disrespectful. So if you're working with the opposite gender, just kind of find what level that they're at and work to that. Same thing with size. Size plays a very, very, very big part in working with a partner. You get a person who's giant, who's two feet taller than you, is gonna be very different than working with someone who's a foot smaller than you. Techniques will change. Techniques have to be altered. And I saw this when I started taking judo and jujitsu. I'm a little bit bigger than some of the people there. I'm definitely heavier. And the funny thing is some of the comments were, were that some of the guys liked me being their partner because it gave them a new challenge because they weren't used to working with somebody my size. And to me, it made me work harder too because if they were smaller than me, I had to work differently than the person who was taller than me. So like to get to do joint throw, I had to find myself dipping down more to get under certain body rotational points versus someone who's larger, I had to use a different tactic. So when you work with partners, size plays a big difference. Size does matter. And you have to adjust what you're doing based on the size of the person. If you're in a self-defense situation, more likely than not, the person's probably gonna be bigger than you. But even if they're smaller, you have to know how to adjust according to each one. And now let's just go over a couple of do's and don'ts. First, don't try to hurt your partner. Don't be that person where you're gonna to try to show them that you're better than they are, or you wanna intimidate them or just dominate them. That, that just doesn't help anyone. And in talking about hurting the people, when you work with a partner for the first time, ask them if they have any injuries that you need to be aware of. You know, they might have a bad knee that day, or maybe they have an old you know, car accident, a back injury. Ask them if there's any restrictions that you need to know ahead of time, because the last thing you wanna do is slip somebody onto a limb that might've been broken you know, a year ago or anything like that. Just so make sure your partner uh, gives you full disclosure on any physical conditions that, that you're working with. Also be clean. Now I understand these are gyms, sweat's gonna happen, you're gonna get dirty, but you know, at least, you know, you're working with other humans. So, you know, brush your teeth, shower, just make sure you're, you've got general hygiene going, especially if you're grappling. You know, you wanna win a grappling match because you got the technique down and you actually beat them fairly, not because they gave up because they could smell the tuna sandwich you had for lunch. So just be clean and be considerate with your classmates. Also, 
Tap when it hurts. When they've got you fair and square, tap. Don't be a tough guy and try to ride it out. If they have you in a legitimate lock or submission technique, you know, you can go from no pain, no pain to a broken elbow like that. So if they have you, if they earned it, okay, you know, respect, you got me, tapped out. Now, if you really do have room to fight and you feel you can get out of it, that's fine, keep going. But when you're at a point where you're gonna panic or you feel like, oh no, I can tough it out, just tap, start over, learn what you did wrong or learn how to get out of it and go again. Again, you don't wanna get hurt with training. This is all about learning to protect yourself. Don't get hurt in the process. So basically, you know, just to recap, you wanna take in resistance training into consideration as well as the control and power that you use with your partner. And it's all about getting better and working with a partner and getting used to working with a partner effectively to better your training. Also, I recommend uh, switching up partners, you know, work with different people. That way you get used to working with different builds and different sizes and different weights and you're not stuck doing the same thing over and over and prevent some habit building. So, hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Uh, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much for watching. As I mentioned, I do heavily recommend the rebreakable boards. They're great for training. They're a lot of fun to use. And also, as we just released a recent video, um, the holiday seasons are coming up. So we did the video on uh, gifts for martial artists. So please go check that out. We just kind of go a few, uh, over a few fun options. And also all of those links from that video, we were putting up below in the description. So you have uh, access to everything. So happy holidays coming up. And also you know, be sure, like, subscribe, join our Patreon, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.